Okay, so just a, a slight introduction for me is uh, I'm a staff sergeant with the New York State Police, and one of my roles there is I coordinate our autonomous vehicle testing and permit process. But even before that, I've been a longtime member of the Highway Safety Committee of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. We were in about 2012, a young engineer by the name of Chris Ermson, who was at that time heading up uh, Google's autonomous vehicles project, came before the Highway Safety Committee to tell us what Google's plan was for autonomous vehicles and why. And for somebody who had spent 25 years in law enforcement, <clears throat> almost all of that dedicated strictly to traffic safety programs. It was a epiphany for me uh, to think that we could eliminate in one fell swoop, if you would, was the idea, 94% of, of fatalities in this country, 1.3 million in the world. Um, but about three seconds after that, I came to the realization how that would affect law enforcement. What would that mean to our profession and how we interact with people? And we've heard a lot about mobility today. Mobility is the answer. Mobility is what this is all about, but mobility is also how we move things illicitly, uh, how we per perpetrate crimes. It is everything in the world of policing. So in 2014, the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, which represents the jurisdictions of the Departments of Motor Vehicles in the U.S. and Canada, decided to stand up a working group on autonomous vehicles. Uh, they realized how this also would affect their industry, their profession, and one of the things that they wanted to focus on was law enforcement. And I came from a background as well in electrification of vehicles and high voltage and what that means for our first responders and alternative fuels and how do we respond to crashes with alternative fuel vehicles. So I jumped in at that opportunity with both feet because I, I realized what this meant. Now, a little background on AMBA 101 uh, is uh, AMBA was founded in 1933, as I said. Uh, and so they have a long-standing uh, mission uh, regarding motor vehicle administration, law enforcement, highway safety, and their mission is to encourage uniformity and reciprocity among the states and provinces. So as we talk about this industry, quite often we hear about this, that we have to avoid this patchwork. Well, that is one of the missions of, of AMBA, is to make sure that we're doing this together and, and doing it in the uh, in the right manner. So from 2014 to last year, uh, we worked on identifying the issues um, around autonomous vehicles and safety, uh, as well as drivers and vehicles. What does it mean in the world of drivers and vehicles? And so we published our guidance document a year ago in May. Um, and we currently have a second version we're working on to include some of the areas that we considered out of scope the first time around. Um, if you're not familiar with these guidelines, I would encourage you to look them up. Um, they have been actually looked at very closely by industry, and industry has, has begun to respond, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little as I go along. So the guidance document looks at these general topic areas, automated vehicle classifications, terms, and uh, technologies, and I'm going to avoid the agenda for the professor. I'm not talking about the, the levels of automation. <laughs> um, but it is important that we have a common set of terms when, when we talk about safety. Uh, administrative considerations, I'm just going to go through them quickly. You can read as well as I can. Testing by the manufacturer, we do recommend that uh, test entities are regulated, that there is some type of a permit process, and that there is a, a, a public uh, responsibility to know what's going on when we're testing on public roads. Uh, vehicle credentialing considerations, so we don't recommend license plates, special license plates for autonomous vehicles, but we do need to consider credentialing from a DMV standpoint. What does driver licensing mean when you may not have an occupant in the vehicle, when you may have an occupant that is it the control of a vehicle? What does that mean at that point? And finally, law enforcement considerations. So we give a total of 65 recommendations to jurisdictions and another 23 to manufacturers, and 16 of those 23 are law enforcement concern. So the law enforcement considerations and the law enforcement subgroup of this organization is composed of representatives of law enforcement from California, Arizona, Michigan, New York, and Florida. Not surprisingly, those are all states that have very active 
uh, testing uh, programs ongoing. Um, so here are really the, the, the considerations. Crash incident reporting, we heard earlier uh, about the importance of, of metrics and knowing what is the frequency of crashes, what's the severity of those crashes. So the, the reporting of crashes and incidents is very important. And what does that mean from a, a law enforcement perspective? Uh, criminal activity, I don't think we have to venture very far to realize the potential for nefarious uses of a self-driving vehicle. Uh, from a law enforcement standpoint, when we talk about testing, we recommend background investigations uh, be conducted on people using those vehicles, testing those vehicles, uh, to ensure that we have people who, who are not of a nefarious background, people that have good driving records, people um, you know, that may not uh, cause problems in, in being on our roads. We recommend an electronic fingerprint of some kind in these vehicles as they develop. So that every input that goes to that vehicle, we have a record of that input somewhere, whether it be by court order or whatnot, we'll know who gave an input, who's responsible for the command being given to that vehicle. Distracted driving, what does distracted driving mean? I mean, we, we, we know what distracted driving means in current laws, but how does that apply during testing and deployment? We believe that if you're a safety operator, there shouldn't be any distracted driving in that vehicle. But as soon as you're no longer maybe in a deployment situation where we're looking at, at very highly automated vehicles, then, then the current distracted driving laws would not apply. Um, enforcement permit conditions, that's really more administrative. But as you're thinking about, if your state or jurisdiction is thinking about implementing a permit process, if that test entity violates those permit conditions, what is your recourse? So that you need to think of those things in advance. Um, First responders, uh, establishing operational responsibility. So the, the worst thing that can happen is to put the onus on that police officer on the road to decide what happens in the event of a crash. How do I investigate this crash? Uh, one of the recommendations that is if you have no occupant or you have a, uh, a level five, sorry, um, vehicle that the registered owner of that vehicle is held responsible for the behavior of that vehicle. Um, first responder safety goes into a, a wide range uh, of, of safety issues, some of, the, some of which, if you uh, are familiar with uh, high voltage power trains, are pretty obvious, uh, different from a petrol based uh, uh, vehicle. But one of the challenges for first responder safety, so even if you come up with a safety plan, there is no safety organization, there's no overriding uh, entity that trains law enforcement in this country or the world. This is a worldwide phenomenon. So when we talked about high voltage and alternative fuel safety, we had the National Fire Protection Association take a lead on that. But even that training, which was developed in 2014, has not made its way even throughout the fire service because the majority of the fire service is volunteers. So very important when we talk about safety that even if we come up with, with safety programs, how does that get down to the guy on the road? Uh, that will actually do the interaction. Uh, oh, vehicle response to emergency vehicles, manual traffic controls, atypical road conditions. These are these are the holy crap moments, right? These are the things we see and we respond when the mattress goes flying out of somebody's truck on the road. Well, how's an autonomous vehicle going to respond to something like that that it may have never seen? And this is where machine learning probably will come in. AI will come in that vehicles will respond to that they've never seen because they've learned to drive, uh, if you will, like we learned to drive. Uh, system misuse and abuse, misuse being some of those Tesla crashes, right? Where somebody's doing something they're not supposed to be doing with that vehicle, whether that be intentional or not. Um, misuse could have, have criminal behavior as well. Vehicle identification, a huge issue. Um, Manufacturers want you to think that their vehicle today that may be completely different, it's a Toyota Camry, but it may have a hydrogen fuel cell, it may have a electric power plant, it may be a hybrid, it may be gasoline, and someday it may be autonomous, and they want you to have the same level of confidence in every one of those vehicles. So they're kind of against identification of these vehicles, and we heard about uh, the Waymo vehicles being attacked in Arizona. That's another one of the issues, is when people start understanding that this is an autonomous vehicle, 
they start behaving in ways that they would ordinarily behave um, with any other vehicle. Adherence to traffic laws, very basic. The vehicles must obey traffic laws, and we heard about, again, the patchwork of traffic laws. But when I look at, think about the, the potential to normalize traffic laws in 50 states of the United States, um, never mind even about the world, I don't see that ever happening. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. When, probably 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to work with the state legislature uh, on occupant protection laws. And occupant protection, seatbelt use is pretty low. And I felt, well, pro part of the problem is that people understand what the law is. So if we can simplify the laws, you're going to get better, uh, better use of the laws. So I actually volunteered to rewrite the thousand pages of the New York State Vehicle Traffic Law and put it in common language so that people could understand it. And I said, if, if I would do that, would the legislature consider adopting it? And they said, absolutely not. It'll never happen. Don't waste your time. <laughs> so I think the potential to do that across 50 states, across Canadian provinces, around the world is silly. And we need to get to, this is probably the easiest place of programming in this whole world of autonomous vehicles, is to make vehicle codes match the vehicle that, where they are, to, to tie the vehicle code to uh, how the vehicle is operating. So I, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm on my own on that one. I think everyone else well, thinks that they're gonna get uh, some type of normalization. Uh, and finally, cybersecurity was not taken up in our first uh, version of the document. Obviously a huge issue, and some of the vehicles you're going to be seeing outside today are vehicles with layered technology. They use a stock vehicle. They layer a bunch of sensors on that vehicle, and somehow we're supposed to believe that's cyber secure. And when you talk to cybersecurity experts, cybersecurity experts say, in order to be truly cybersecurity, you need to build from the bottom up. Cybersecurity needs to be built into the very fabric of that thing that you're building. So this is going to be a big challenge moving forward as we move in the evolution from ADAS systems um, into truly autonomous vehicles. And law enforcement interaction plans. And this is really where I want to focus a little bit more of my presentation. Um, jump two slides there. So this is but the uh, uh, Council of State Legislatures is a representation of the United States. How many states have passed some type of authorizing legislation? 29 states in the District of Columbia, 11 by executive order, uh, others by legislation, and four states by both. So the reason that I, I bring that up is that regardless of how they got there, we're seeing now the emergence of requirements for law enforcement interaction plans or first responder interaction plans. And I think this is a good thing. This is a good thing for society. It's certainly a good thing for my profession. Like most things that began in California, with California's purely driverless regs, California required that anyone who wanted to operate to test a purely driverless vehicle on their roads needed to submit a law enforcement interaction, interaction plan to the California Highway Patrol which would evaluate the sufficiency of that information and create a dialogue with the manufacturer and then it also required training of law enforcement in whatever that operational design domain would be. And uh, that has spread. It was passed in Arizona by executive order mandated that uh, law enforcement interaction plans be, de be developed and submitted to the Arizona DPS. And in addition to that, that the Arizona DPS create a law enforcement policy for that would govern the state. So they've taken it, not only taking in a plan from a manufacturer, but taking that information and pushing it out and, and, and codifying how law enforcement officers, officers would interact with these vehicles. Oh, sorry. Uh, in my own state of New York, our, our law currently requires the same thing. So if you want to test an autonomous vehicle in New York, I would get your law enforcement interaction plan uh, evaluate that interaction plan, work with the test entity, and then meet with all the first responder agencies to make sure that they're content with the content of that and that this test that the manufacturer is proposing, uh, test or demonstration, can be uh, done safely. Pennsylvania is worth mentioning as well because they don't have authorizing legislation. They have purely guidance, but in their guidance they, rec 
recommend that manu any manufacturer wishing, wishing to test in Pennsylvania submit either a voluntary safety assessment, which is, re is recommended as well by <coughs> the US DOT, or in the absence of that, that they uh, submit what they call a uh, safety and uh, risk mitigation plan, which is essentially a law enforcement interaction plan. And the state of Oregon has just, uh, as of last September, recommended to their legislature that they pass similar legislation. So I see these things growing around the country as I see the evolution of laws and, and, and uh, policies uh, governing these vehicles, and, and that's a good thing for public safety. And lastly, I want to finish because I want to finish on this because this is what the, the industry has been doing. And if you look at the General Motors and Ford, these are their, their voluntary safety assessment plans that they submitted to uh, the US DOT. In the early versions of these, they were more like sales brochures. They were all about, our company is all about safety, and this is how we go about doing our business, and, and very kind of obtuse. And once we got down to law enforcement interaction plans, which is what you see there from Waymo, they became very detailed. And the same thing here, you're looking at Neuro's uh, voluntary safety assessment. I just recently looked at one from AutoX. Each time I look at one of these, they get more and more detailed, and that, I think, is what is going to be needed to protect law enforcement, allow us to protect the public. Uh, and because if you don't have safety, you don't have security, you will not have public confidence, and you will not have a market for any of this. So if I'm going to realize my goal of saving that, those, that 40, or I'm sorry, 94%, 1.3 million lives around the world sometime, uh, in my lifetime, or even a percentage of that, we need to get these vehicles on the road. We need to understand what they can and what they can't do, and we're going to get there together. We have to get there with the manufacturers working cooperation. So that's my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them.